For almost a thousand years, Windsor Castle has been the home of the kings and queens of England. From this ancient fortress near London, Queen Victoria reigned over a vast and expanding empire over which it was said, the sun never sent. But in 1861, in her 24th year as queen, the shadows descended. Death robbed the queen of her beloved husband, Prince Albert. Victoria ordered that his dressing room be preserved as a shrine. Then she donned the robes of mourning she would wear for the rest of her life. But the loss of Albert would have more profound consequences. It would plunge the queen and her greatest statesmen into a titanic struggle for the heart and soul of her empire. Queen Victoria had been inspired by Prince Albert's ideas, and in particular by his vision of Camelot, the fabled realm of King Arthur. According to legend, Arthur ruled over an empire whose greatness was judged not by the extent of its conquests, but by a belief that the strong should serve the weak, that good must triumph over evil, that might should be in the service of right. Albert hoped that these principles would be the guiding light for Victoria and for her people. But in the coming years, that dream would be shattered as the queen, alone and more vulnerable, allowed the empire to take a very different path, a path which would lead her to the betrayal of Albert's ideals. Victoria changed after Albert's death. In Albert's day, his feeling of civilizing the world meant bringing uh, trade and education and uh, progress and uh, better standards of living to people. Victoria became less interested in that. Victoria wanted England to be dominant, to be preeminent. She thought it was the destiny of Britain to rule as much of the world as possible. Victoria's empire had come about more by accident than by design. It was an empire based on trade, and to sustain it, the British had acquired naval bases, coaling stations, and colonies around the globe. By the middle of the 19th century, the British had become the richest and most powerful nation in the world. They had pioneered the age of steam. They made more than half the world's industrial goods and three quarters of the world's trade was carried in British ships. But despite this success, Victoria's cities were pits of poverty and deprivation. There was never enough housing. The services were appalling, overcrowding, very, um, really very, very poor conditions. It was very easy for many just to lock themselves away and not to notice. Even in a great city like London, so many living in great houses could just shut their eyes to the huge disparities in wealth that industrialization was throwing up. Nonetheless, Victoria's subjects, rich and poor, were united in the belief that God had chosen them for a special mission, to export not just the product of their industry, but their ideas of government, law, and morality. Britain is a democracy, and the British people wish to know why their government is behaving in a certain way. If it is acquiring more territory, if it is fighting wars, then they'd like to know the reason. And the simple reason is uh, development of the older idea of Britain as the agent of civilization. Britain is bringing peace and order and stability to the world, uh, to distant regions. In the Victorian mind, nowhere was this civilizing mission more compelling or more dangerous than in Africa. In the mid-19th century, Africa was known as the Dark Continent its vast interior largely unexplored by white men. It was believed by the Victorians to be a place of pagan worship, of blood sacrifice and tribal conflict. 
Inspired by Albert's vision of Camelot, men and women of the London Missionary Society journeyed here on a crusade to win converts to the Christian God, resolute in the belief that they were civilizing the continent. They included a man whose journeys into the heart of Africa would make him the most famous explorer of the Victorian age. His name was David Livingston, a Scotsman. Born into a family of poor but passionate Christians, he worked in a cotton mill from the age of 10 and paid his own way through medical college. As a boy, he was very interested in the world around him. Uh, stories about him looking for fossils in quarries and uh, interested in the plants and so on. So he had an interest in this natural world and, and science, of course, was developing at that time. I suppose that that's why he sort of uh, began to feel that, that he could do something through medicine to relieve suffering and so on. He had heard that you could be a medical missionary and that's, that's what he said, that's for me. And his father was a bit against this. He said, oh, doctors, oh, they, they just look for their fees and so on. But he was uh, fired with enthusiasm to take the gospel further. And um, working as a doctor and a missionary, he wasn't just going to deal with the, the spiritual side, he'd deal with the bodily side as well. When Livingston began his travels, the main British possession in Africa was a mere toehold on the southern tip of this vast continent. The port of Cape Town was a staging post on the long sea route to India. British governments had no interest in the interior, which was believed to be just thousands of miles of arid scrubland. But as Livingston traveled northward to the continent's great central plateau, he discovered a different Africa. The scenery changed dramatically from desert to grassland, with tall trees and exotic wildlife. Livingston wrote copious notes, documenting all the flora and fauna in minute detail. But it was a less pleasant encounter with the local wildlife that would first make him famous back in England. The doctor was working on an irrigation ditch when he was alerted that some lions were approaching the camp. He ran back to help his colleagues, but found himself the target of the lion's attack. He squeezed off one shot, but only grazed the beast. The wounded animal pounced. A native bear saved his life. But Livingston had been badly mauled and his arm was broken. It was a terrible experience. And it wasn't just broken, but you see, it was, it was crushed as well. Miles from medical help, Livingston treated his own wounds. He even managed to insert a screw into the broken bone. I presume he was putting sticks, uh, splints around and tying it. And, you know, what he couldn't do, he'd be, he would have somebody say, hold this and tie there and whatnot. Very painful. And, of course, very difficult to get a good, a good setting in that way. Weeks later, a fellow doctor inspected Livingstone's wound with astonishment. He showed an amount of courage, sagacity, skill and endurance that have scarcely been surpassed in the annals of heroism. Such stories, published by Livingston and others, reached a wide audience in Europe and America. Readers were inspired not just with a sense of adventure, but with the feeling that they were joining the missionaries in an historic crusade. The missionaries see themselves as the pathfinders of civilization. They are, uh, sort of like Livingston, they can be explorers. The other value the missionaries have is that they are direct links between empire and the ordinary people. Everyone said prayers in church for their missions. Many churches and chapels supported their own missionary and regularly heard from him and sent money to him. And, of course, people liked to read about this, and uh, it made them, if you like, feel good. I remember reading a marvellous one which said, think of these unhappy pagans and how much your money can help to bring them to Christ, to redemption, etc., etc.
Despite his growing fame, Livingston had little success in Christianizing the Africans. His only recorded conversion was the baptism of a chief called Suchele. The trouble was, Chief Suchele had several wives, but he had to have only one wife who was going to join the church. But he was a very sincere man. He put his other wives away, gave them presents and said, sorry, I'm taking this new religion. He, he became a Christian. And, and that, as been said, was Livingston's only convert. And then it said, but he fell by the wayside because within a short time, he took one of his wives back. When the chief lapsed, Livingston was devastated, but he continued his quest to bring medicine and Christianity to Africa. He endured terrible hardships, heat, rain and mud, the constant fear of attack from animals or hostile tribes, of desertion by his own men, and of disease. During the first three years of his travels, Livingston suffered 27 bouts of fever. He struggled across rivers and through tropical forests with a racing heart, agonizing headaches, dizziness and diarrhea. He was driven by his Christian ideals and a nearly messianic self-belief. See, O Lord, how the heathen rise up against me as they did to thy son. Should such a man as I flee, Nay, verily. After 15 years of exploration, Livingston made his most spectacular discovery. They came down this great broad river which spreads out to oh, more than a mile wide there. And they came down and there's an island ahead and the water was flowing on either side and he said that we're going we're to make this or we're going to be swept to one side or the other. Then you land on the island as he did and looked over and you saw this huge fall, the largest curtain of water in the world. He felt this was a, a wonder of nature, a wonder of God's creation. He said, angels in their flight must have seen sights like this. Livingston named the site in honor of his queen, the Victoria Falls. Livingston continued northwards and came across a spectacle that was to change his entire mission. He was horrified to see chain gangs being driven to the coast bound for the slave markets of Arabia. The sights I have seen, though common incidents of the traffic, are so nauseous that I always strive to drive them from memory. But the slaving scenes come back unbidden and make me start up at dead of night, horrified by their vividness. Slavery had been banned throughout the British Empire in 1833, and the Royal Navy tried to intercept illegal slave runners bound for America. But the slave trade continued unchallenged in East Africa. Livingston was determined that Britain must rid the continent of what he called the open sore of the world. He concluded that the slavers must be tempted into more acceptable ways of making a living, that Africa must be civilized not by force, but by trade. My desire is to open a path into Africa, that civilization, commerce, and Christianity might find their way there. He would devote himself to exploration and attempt to find a route for British trade into the interior. Where commerce led, the cross would surely follow, and with it he hoped freedom and justice for the enslaved people of Africa.
Livingston appealed to the crusading spirit that thrived in Victoria's Britain. A spirit that was embodied in the new Houses of Parliament in the heart of the British capital. Prince Albert had spent the last 10 years of his life supervising the decoration of what he saw as a temple to civilized values, good government, law, and the Christian religion. At the heart of the building was the robing room, where the queen would don the robes of sovereignty for the state opening of parliament. Here, in all its glory, was Prince Albert's vision of Camelot. The paintings he commissioned would be a permanent reminder of the legend of King Arthur. These heroic figures were to be role models for soldiers and scientists, the explorers and missionaries who would spread British values around the globe. But how to spread this vision remained a hotly contested question. In the House of Commons, this question was fiercely debated by Parliament's elected members led by two men whose views of Victoria's empire were diametrically opposed. On the one hand, the conservative Benjamin Disraeli, a passionate advocate of imperial power and glory. And on the other, his lifelong adversary, the liberal William Gladstone, who championed the moral vision of Prince Albert and David Livingston. Gladstone was driven by a sense of high moral purpose and a heavy burden of guilt, in part because his own family had once made a fortune from slave labor. As the leader of the Liberal Party, Gladstone campaigned for the export of civilized values through commerce, not conquest. Gladstone feels that the empire is there, there's not much you can do about it. He doesn't want to add to it, and he believes that imperialism is a creed which can contaminate the British people, uh, make them warlike, aggressive, um, whereas he thinks of a world in which there is universal peace. When he looks at imperialism, he says, is this godly? And he decides it isn't. He sees it as might somehow triumphing over right. And he's rather frightened if the British people get in trance with empire. They'll go gallivanting off, fighting wars here, there, and everywhere. They'll spend a lot of money and cease to be a moral force in the world. This view was fiercely contested by his great rival, Benjamin Disraeli. Disraeli first moved into the Prime Minister's office in 1867, and for the next 15 years, he and Gladstone would alternate in power. Disraeli believed in the expansion of the British Empire. He liked to claim that his ancestors had been rich Venetian merchants trading with the Orient and this gave him a romantic enthusiasm for imperial adventures. Disraeli viewed the empire as an extraordinary asset. The empire made Britain a great power, a global power, and also enabled it to have plenty of muscle in Europe. And Disraeli, of course, likes the glamour of empire. He sees it uh, bestowing prestige on the country. He eventually hopes that the white colonies will not follow the American course, but remain emotionally tied to Britain, particularly through the person of the crown. But Victoria was still in deep mourning. Since the death of Prince Albert, she had lost interest in the empire and all other affairs of state. Victoria went into what I called Perda, I think because she felt incompetent to handle being a queen. Albert had done the work for her so long. Albert had done everything, thought out everything for her arranged everything for her, that she did not feel she was up to it again. The Queen found some consolation with the Scotsman John Brown. She began writing about him a few months after Albert's death. I have an invaluable Highland servant who is my factotum here and takes the most wonderful care of me, combining the offices of groom, footman, page and maid, I might almost say, as he is so handy about cloaks and shawls. He always leads my pony, and always attends me out of doors. I think she also enjoyed his uh, picking her up in his arms, uh, and uh, putting her on her horse, and taking her off her horse again. For the first time since Albert, she had a strong, brawny man uh, who uh, held her in his arms. 
And I think that's as far as the sexuality really went, but she enjoyed it. To the dismay of her family and government, the Queen and her Highland servant became inseparable. A section of press and public called her Mrs. Brown, and her absence from public duty was widely condemned. There were cartoons in the newspapers about this, with showing an empty throne. Uh, there were uh, editorials in the newspapers about it. Why are we paying so much money uh, to maintain a royal family? Uh, because the royal family is the symbol uh, of the empire and of Britain, and here we don't have one. It was Disraeli who would rekindle the Queen's interest in public affairs. His relationship with Victoria had begun badly. She saw him as an upstart, an opportunist, what the British call a chancer. But Disraeli, with his considerable charm, set out to win her. His official dispatches to her were spiced with social gossip and witty anecdotes. Part of Disraeli's job as Prime Minister was to write an account of um, what was happening in Parliament and what was going on in the Cabinet to the Queen. And Disraeli's letters to the Queen were wonderfully detailed and rather gossipy and actually rather indiscreet. Um, he probably told the Queen far more than he ought to have done, particularly about divisions of opinion. Um, most people, made uh, Prime Ministers, made these letters very brief and rather official. But Disraeli's letters to Victoria uh, were full of sort of protestations of affection and um, love and loyalty. They were largely sugar. But Queen Victoria lapped it up. And for once, the Queen was amused. She wrote to her eldest daughter, Vicky. Mr. Disraeli's reports are just like his novels, highly colored. She'd never had such letters in her life, she declared, and had never before known everything. Her attitude to the upstart underwent a dramatic change. Mr. Disraeli has achieved his present high position entirely by his ability, his wonderful, happy disposition, and I have nothing but praise for him. She sent him primroses that she picked herself. In return, Disraeli gave her a set of his novels. Victoria had just published a book of her own, a reminiscence of her days with Prince Albert at their palace in Scotland. Disraeli was awfully good at just saying the tactful remark uh, that Queen Victoria would enjoy. For example, uh, one of the best was Disraeli saying to her, we authors, ma'am, which was precisely what Victoria longed to hear, that they were both part of the same club of writers. Disraeli bewitched the Queen with his romantic vision of the British Empire. It would have horrified Prince Albert. In the future, Victoria and Disraeli would form a powerful alliance for the imperial cause but it would be some time before their partnership would bear fruit. Disraeli's first term as prime minister lasted less than a year. When he was voted out of office, the queen had to send for the leader of the liberals, Gladstone. Victoria began by liking Gladstone. He seemed to be an upright man. Uh, he was ambitious, but he was also extremely smart. Prince Albert had warmly approved of Gladstone. When the new prime minister came to the palace to receive the seals of office, the queen recorded her approval. He is very agreeable, so quiet and intellectual, with such a knowledge of all subjects, and is such a good man. But her satisfaction did not last. Gladstone embarked on a whirlwind of liberal reforms that revived conservative instincts in the Queen that had been dormant while Albert was alive. Mr. Gladstone is a very dangerous man, and so very arrogant, tyrannical and obstinate, with no knowledge of the world or human nature. All this, and much want of regard towards my feelings, make him a very dangerous and unsatisfactory Premier. She was not amused when he proposed that sailors might be permitted to grow beards, and she was horrified by moves towards female equality. 
The Queen draws Mr. Gladstone's attention to the mad and utterly demoralizing movement of the present day to place women in the same position as men. But it was Gladstone's private life that caused Victoria the most concern. Because of his fanatical religion, he felt everybody had to be converted to his ways of morality and ethics. He would go out in the streets at night, even when he was prime minister, uh, and solicit prostitutes, uh, take them back to their rooms, give them Bibles. Uh, he would give them money and he would ask them to uh, tread the straight and narrow ways. Victoria got to know this because her maids in waiting told her everything and it repelled her. At one point, when Gladstone was to go up to visit Victoria at Balmoral, she sent him a letter telling him that when he arrived, it was to be with a new suit of clothes that he had never worn before. It was very clear that she wanted nothing of the degrading uh, atmosphere of his involvement with these uh, ladies of the evening. Gladstone was unconcerned by the Queen's personal disapproval of him, but he was appalled by the imperialist ideas she had picked up from Disraeli. His own more liberal views of Britain's role were confidently being put to the test in Africa. David Livingston had returned to his dark continent. This time he had been sent on an official mission to find a trading route into the interior and to achieve his dream of combining commerce, civilization, and the Christian religion. To this end, he was provided with generous funds by the British government and accompanied by six British scientists and his wife, Mary, herself a devoted missionary. Livingston believed that the Zambezi River could become a great highway for British industrial goods. But as they voyaged along the river, the expedition ran into dangerous rapids. He believed that the Zambezi could be a trade route, this great river, which he'd seen at Victoria Falls. But when he traveled down it, he missed out one or two sections. He took shortcuts. That was a very reasonable thing to do. It saved a lot of time. But these shortcuts were quite impossible. And that's what the uh, Zambezi expedition found, that his hope of this being a great highway into the center of Africa wasn't there. Livingston refused to admit defeat. He kept up the search for a trading route. But then the expedition confronted another and more frightening peril. Despite repeated attacks of malaria, Livingston had dismissed the danger of disease. I apprehend no great mortality among missionaries, men of education and prudence who can, if they will, adopt proper hygienic precautions. But this optimism was to lead to tragedy. Mary Livingston was one of the first to go down with a fever. On the 29th of April, 1862, Livingston wrote to his mother, My beloved partner, whom I loved and treasured so much for 18 years, is with Jesus. She was a good wife, a good mother, and a good Christian. I feel greatly distressed and weep bitter tears. Livingston had paid a high price for his beliefs and his grief would not end with the death of his wife. He had set out to civilize Africa through commerce, but back in England, popular enthusiasm for his exploits was generating a new hunger for conquest. Livingston's expedition had failed. Disease had caused the deaths of 12 of his companions and none of his objectives was attained. Livingston was recalled by the British government and returned home to face scathing attacks in the press. We were promised cotton, sugar, indigo, and we got none. We were promised trade, and there is no trade. We were promised converts, and not one has been made. In a word, 
thousands subscribed by the universities and contributed by the government have been productive of the most fatal results. Israeli agreed with every word, and he soon seized the chance to promote his own vision of empire. When he won the next election, the queen greeted his victory with delight. I saw Mr. Disraeli at quarter to three today. He knelt down and kissed hands, saying, I plight my troth to the kindest of mistresses. The silver-tongued charmer was back in office. As he had once confided to a friend, You have heard me called a flatterer, and it is true. Everyone likes flattery, and when you come to royalty, you should lay it on with a trowel. Disraeli always loved the company of women, and he was very good at flattering women. And I think with Queen Victoria, he was able to see that she was lonely. And Disraeli was able to charm her and to flatter her. And I think very importantly, one of the things that Disraeli did was to encourage her to take a far more active role in public affairs. The result of this was that basically he had Queen Victoria as um, an ally, particularly when he was Prime Minister. And this was absolutely crucial, I think, to the success of Disraeli's ministry, that the monarchy was behind it. Disraeli set out to increase Britain's prestige and expand Victoria's empire. And within a year of taking office, fate dealt him a brilliant opportunity. Just five years before, the Suez Canal had been carved through the Egyptian desert. It permitted ocean-going ships to pass between the Mediterranean and the Red Sea, linking Europe and the East. For Britain, it was the lifeline to her greatest imperial possession. India, with 400 million people, was the largest overseas territory any empire has ever owned. The Queen called it the most precious jewel in her crown, and Israeli feared that a rival power would cut the new imperial artery. The Suez Canal was absolutely crucial to Britain's empire. Um, Suez was the jugular vein, if you like, of the British Empire. It was through the Suez Canal that the route to India, the short route to India, which was so strategically important, happened. Uh, so for Disraeli, it was very important, and he was quite right in this, I think, uh, that Britain should have a controlling influence over the Suez Canal. The shares in the Suez Canal Company were owned by a number of French investors and the ruler of Egypt, the Khedif. The Khedif had spent Egypt's wealth on palaces, museums, and railways. Now he was deep in debt to banks in London and Paris. The canal showed no prospect of paying a dividend for years, and he desperately needed funds. In 1875, he made a secret offer to the British. Disraeli wrote urgently to the Queen. Mr. Disraeli, with his humble duty to your majesty, the Khedif, on the eve of bankruptcy, appears desirous of parting with his shares in the Suez Canal and has communicated confidentially. It is an affair of millions, about four at least, but it is vital to your majesty's authority and power at this critical moment that the canal should belong to England. The Cadiff now says that it is absolutely necessary that he should have between three and four million sterling by the 30th of this month. Scarcely a breathing time, but the thing must be done. The Queen replied by telegram the following day, approving his course of action, but fearing that it would be difficult to arrange. Normally, Parliament could have granted a government loan, but Parliament was not in session, and the French consortium had already bid for the shares. The Israeli sent his private secretary to seek help from an old friend. Baron Rothschild was the head of the great banking family and one of the richest men in the world. The secretary explained that the Israeli needed four million pounds, the price of the Kadesh shares in the Suez Canal. When, asked Rothschild. By tomorrow, answered the secretary. Rothschild picked up a grape, spat out the pits, and said, What is your security? The British government, was the reply. You shall have it, said the Baron. 
Disraeli wrote to the Queen in triumph. It is just settled. You have it, madam. The French government has been outgeneraled, and the entire interest of the Cadiff is now yours. The Queen was delighted. Disraeli treated her not only as his monarch, but as a woman, and a woman of intelligence. When the canal deal was done, she wrote in her journal, Complete security for India, an immense thing. Mr. Disraeli said that my support had been a great help. His mind is so much greater, and his apprehension of things great and small so much quicker than that of Mr. Gladstone. Gladstone was strongly opposed to the deal because he thought it would draw Britain into new imperial commitments. He was right. The Suez Canal was to drag the British deeper and deeper into the murky politics of the Middle East. The overlords of the entire region were the Turks, but many of their subject peoples were rising against them. Faced with rebellion on all sides, the Turks resorted to mass slaughter. Russia backed the rebels, and Israeli feared that the Turkish Empire would collapse and open the way for the Russians to advance on the Suez Canal. However badly they treated their subjects, Israeli thought Britain had to support the Turks. But Gladstone thought otherwise. He was no longer the leader of the liberals. He had retired to his country estate where he relaxed by chopping trees and setting down his thoughts on God. But he was appalled by stories of Turkish atrocities against their Christian subjects. He thought the corrupt and crumbling Turkish empire should be brought to an end. He laid down his axe and he took up his pen. There is not a cannibal in the South Sea Islands whose indignation would not arise and overboil at the recital of what has been done. Let the Turks now carry away their abuses in the only possible manner, namely by carrying off themselves. This thorough riddance, this most blessed deliverance, is the only reparation we can make to the memory of those heaps and heaps of dead, to the violated purity alike of matrons, maiden, and of child. Disraeli called the style of Gladstone's protest vulgar, remarking that of all the atrocities, Gladstone's writings were probably the worst. But Gladstone had caught the public mood, and in the House of Commons, Disraeli was forced to choose his words with more care. Our duty at this critical moment is to maintain the empire of England, nor will we agree to any step, though it may obtain for a moment comparative quiet and a false prosperity, that hazards the existence of empire. Disraeli backed his words with action. As the Russians advanced on the Turkish capital, he dispatched a British fleet, led by the most powerful battleship in the world, HMS Devastation. Public opinion swung to Disraeli's side. <laughs> War fever spread through the pubs and music halls of Britain. The British may not have liked what the Turks were doing to their Christian subjects, but they shared the Israelis' determination to stop the Russians. Most ordinary British people see Russia as an antithesis of Britain. Here is Britain, progressive and enlightened. There is Russia, ignorant, backward, ruled by a despot uh, uh, with most of its population in abject slavery as serfs. Um, so there was a sort of great deal of Russophobia in Britain. Russia was just disliked as an odious country. Fearful of war with Britain, the Russians agreed to negotiate. Israelis set off to attend peace talks. He returned in triumph. His diplomacy had forced the Russians to halt their advance in the Middle East. The lifeline to India 
was secure. Victoria shared the public rejoicing and decided it was the right moment to claim what she considered to be long overdue. In common conversation, I am sometimes called Empress of India. Why have I never officially assumed this title? I feel I ought to do so, and wish to have preliminary inquiries made. Disraeli introduced a bill in Parliament to bestow on Victoria the title Queen Empress of India. Gladstone led the opposition, calling the move theatrical bombast and folly. But the title was granted and the Queen was delighted. She expressed her gratitude by making Disraeli an earl. She was deeply grateful to Disraeli for this. It was, if you like, uh, embellishing the British monarchy and at the same time the Queen is given a new sense of responsibility. She is deeply interested in India. Uh, immediately she is made empress, she sets out to, to learn Hindustani. It doesn't make much headway, but a lot, of, a lot of goodwill there. And she also hires Indian servants. Various Maharajas sent her jewelry uh, to adorn her as Empress of India. Uh, and on uh, a New Year's Day, I believe, in 1876, uh, she put on some of the jewelry, uh, which didn't go with her bulky uh, build. And Disraeli was there. Uh, and admired them, and she said, uh, do you want to see the rest of them that I'm not wearing? And of course he had to say yes, and she brought out boxes of jewels, uh, which represented what India meant to her. Between them, the Queen Empress and her newly ennobled Prime Minister appealed to an imperial spirit that was spreading through large sections of the British public. An aggressive spirit, flexing British muscle and lording it over the world. Gladstone continued to oppose it. He called it showy imperialism. Even Disraeli's own foreign secretary wrote privately of his concerns. Disraeli believes thoroughly in prestige and would think it in the interests of the country to spend 200 millions on war if the result was to make foreign states think more highly of us. The Queen backed Disraeli to the hilt. If we are to maintain our position as a first-rate power, we must, with our Indian Empire and large colonies, be prepared for attacks and wars somewhere or other continually. But the strain of this imperialist policy was beginning to show. British forces in southern Africa had clashed with the most powerful warrior nation on the continent, the Zulu. At the Battle of Isandlwana, 600 British soldiers were wiped out to a man. It took 17,000 British reinforcements, armed with the latest artillery, to defeat an enemy, armed largely with spears. Back in England, a powerful voice was raised in protest. Gladstone was no longer in control of Parliament, so he appealed directly to the British people. The sanctity of life in the hill villages is as inviolable in the eye of Almighty God as can be your own. The power of his oratory drew vast crowds. Ten thousand Zulus had died, he claimed. For no other offense than to defend against pure artillery with their naked bodies, their hearts, their homes, their wives, their families. I mean, it is one of the great mysteries about Gladstone, how his oratory was so effective. Because he wasn't a tremendous phrase maker, and he didn't talk down to his audience, as you are, talked up to them, and yet he held them for these very long periods. For an hour and a half, it was quite normal in great mass meetings. I think it was essentially his physical presence, also a flash of his eagle's eye, the drama of his gestures, the cadence of his voice. I was fascinated when an old man came up to me and said, my father used to be a shouter for Gladstone. It was absolutely precise meeting. He was employed at a Gladstone meeting, together with a number of other people, to stand about 20 to 30 yards back, back from the platform and to turn round and attempt to relay Gladstone to the uh, more distant audience. He's going on to Bulgarian atrocities now. 
And it do does seem to be absolute proof that a lot of the uh, fringes, or even wide fringes of the meeting, could not actually hear what Gladstone was saying. But the fact that he could hold a mass audience standing for an hour and a half when they couldn't really hear what he was saying is the most tremendous tribute I can think of to, um, to, to the sheer force of his physical presence. The Queen was outraged. She complained in her journal. Mr. Gladstone is going about like an American stomping orator, making most violent speeches. But to her surprise and dismay, Gladstone had struck a popular chord. Once more, he had appealed to the British sense of justice and fair play. They voted the Liberals back into power with a massive majority. Gladstone wrote exultantly of the defeat of Disraeli and the showy imperialism he represented. It is like the vanishing of some magnificent castle in an Italian romance. Prince Albert would have shared Gladstone's pleasure at the dismissal of Disraeli's warmongering government. But Victoria had turned her back on Albert's moral vision for the Empire. She stubbornly refused to accept Gladstone as her new Prime Minister. She wrote to her private secretary, the Queen will sooner abdicate than send for or have any communication with that half-mad firebrand who would soon ruin everything and be a dictator. Others but herself may submit to his democratic rule, but not the Queen. But she was a constitutional monarch, and submit she must. Gladstone returned to power, determined to reverse Disraeli's imperialist policies. He set out to achieve home rule for Ireland, he pressed for the appointment of more Indian judges and ensured that Englishmen could no longer refuse to appear before them. But in Africa, Gladstone could do little to halt the public hunger for conquest, a hunger nourished by the further adventures of David Livingston. Livingston had returned to Africa to search for the source of the River Nile. For five years, he disappeared without a trace and his obituary even appeared in the press. There's no doubt that traveling in Africa had gone into his blood, but it was also, I think, he felt that if he succeeded in this, he would gain credibility again. He would show himself as the person who'd explored and found the source of the Nile, and that would give credence to his views on slavery and the development of Africa through Christianity and commerce. But he was, at this time, more and more affected by illness. He was losing, he was losing blood. He would have attacks of malaria and dysentery. He had hemorrhoids, and he was a, a very, very sick man. A journalist, Henry Morton Stanley, was sent to Africa by an American newspaper with orders to find the lost missionary. Stanley fought his way through warring tribes, spurred on by reported sightings of Livingston. After seven months, he finally reached the remote trading post deep in the interior. And here, in November 1871, a famous meeting took place. Up to Livingston, I presume. Whether or not the immortal words were fact or fiction, Stanley had found his man. The news was telegraphed around the world. But when the headlines had faded, Livingston was still in Africa, alone, desperately lonely and increasingly unwell. Close to death, he wrote a final letter beseeching the world to abolish the slave trade. All I can add in my loneliness is may heaven's rich blessing come down on everyone, American, English, or Turk, who will help to heal the open sore of the world. On the night of April 30th, 1873, David Livingston died. His body was wrapped in a shroud of tree bark and calico for its long journey back to England. 
But first, Livingston's servants cut his heart out and buried it under a tree, so that it would always remain in Africa. When the body finally arrived in Britain, the Queen declared a day of national mourning. Livingston was buried in Westminster Abbey, and the words of his final letter were engraved on his tomb. But Livingston's African adventures had an effect he would never have endorsed. The opening up of the Dark Continent by missionaries, traders, and explorers launched a race for colonies that would become known as the Scramble for Africa. The pressure for British involvement in this land grab would shake all Gladstone's resolve to avoid further imperial commitment. It would bring Queen and Prime Minister to mutual loathing and ensure that the last act in the drama of Victoria's empire would be spectacular and bloody. Africa, the dark continent of the early explorers, became the stage for the final act in the story of Queen Victoria's empire. In the footsteps of missionaries like David Livingston, the powers of Europe conducted a brutal race for colonies. In Britain, this last burst of expansion was inspired by two men whose stories would bring the British people to a climax of imperialistic fervor. The first, General Charles Gordon. Sent on a diplomatic mission to a poor Arab country, he launched a personal crusade to free an oppressed people. His defiant stand would draw his queen and her empire into a holy war and lead them on a romantic but violent quest to impose a new world order. The second, Cecil John Rhodes, started out as a simple cotton farmer, and he became the greatest empire builder of his generation. To fund his dreams of conquest, he embarked on a ruthless pursuit of diamonds, gold, and power that made him the most formidable and the most hated man in Africa. Between them, Cecil Rhodes and Charles Gordon exemplified the virtues and the vices of their age. They would lead the British to new heights of glory, and they would expose the dark underside of Victoria's empire. At the age of 60, Queen Victoria still wore the black satin and lace she had donned in mourning for her beloved husband, Prince Albert, who had died 20 years before. To her 350 million subjects across the world, she was the godlike symbol of British power and prestige. But in the winter of 1884, her empire faced a serious threat from one of the poorest and most obscure regions on Earth, the Sudan. There is this saying among the Arabs, when Allah made the Sudan, he laughed. In Queen Victoria's time, most of its nine million people were nomads roaming a wilderness as large as Western Europe. The Sudan had no roads, no railways, and most of it was unmapped. Out of this wilderness came a prophet, an Islamic preacher who became known to the Arabs and then to the world as the Mahdi the expected one. The Mahdi inspired the warlike tribes of the Sudan to rise up against their corrupt rulers. His army swept through the country like the Samoom itself, the notorious wind of the desert. Many in England soon feared that the Jihad, or Holy War, would sweep northward into Egypt and threaten the lifeline of the British Empire, the Suez Canal. Three quarters of the ships using the canal were British, and it formed a vital link to Victoria's richest possessions in India and the East. For this reason, British troops were stationed in Egypt to protect it. Now the Queen urged her Prime Minister Gladstone to use those troops against the Mahdi. 
The Queen feels very strongly about the Sudan and Egypt, and she must say she thinks a blow must be struck. These are wild Arabs, and they would not stand against regular troops at all. We must make a demonstration of strength. Gladstone did his level best to treat the Queen with courtesy, but he did not place great value on her judgment. Quite worthless. Gladstone's an extraordinary statesman. As a young man, he is a Tory, very right-wing views. As an old man, he has very left-wing and radical views. As most people get more conservative as they get older, he makes the reverse journey. But the most important thing in Gladstone's life is that whenever he has any problem, any political problem, he speaks to God. He asks for God's guidance. Gladstone was a champion of human rights, and he believed in opposing tyranny. He was against the use of British troops to suppress what he saw as a popular uprising in the Sudan. But the press and public were of the Queen's opinion. They wanted action. Gladstone's government decided to play for time. They proposed sending a top army officer to the Sudan to report on the situation. For this mission, they chose one of the most popular heroes of the Victorian age, General Charles George Gordon. Gordon had made his name in China, where he had been sent to help defend British traders from the horrors of the Civil War. He took command of a small force of peasants and adventurers, known as the Ever-Victorious Army. He was relentlessly brave, and he led the uh, Ever-Victorious Army to victory like a medieval knight. He would charge against hordes of the enemy, um, just carrying his officer's cane. He called it his wand of victory. And in a lightning campaign of about 18 months, he destroyed the Taiping Rebellion and restored peace to the country. And Gordon became a hero. When he returned to England, he found rather his surprise that everybody wanted to see him, that he was invited to, uh, to meet the Queen. And for the rest of his life, he was known as Chinese Gordon. The Chinese emperor had offered Gordon a fortune to stay. Gordon had declined. He had not the slightest interest in money. In an age famed for its English eccentrics, Gordon was a very strange fish indeed. The big interest of his life, the one which it was um, far more than a hobby, it was practically an obsession, was the care of children, particularly small boys. He would seek out starving children sleeping in doorways, uh, chimney sweeps, bring them back to his billet, wash them, clothe them, uh, send them to school, uh, give them pocket money, see to their education, find them jobs. He had dozens of these children eventually, dotted all over the empire, had a map with little flags on where these children were currently living or currently working. He called them his kings. And when people offered him money, he only took enough to subsidize the education of these, these children. And there was nothing odd about that, and no one has ever suggested at any time that his interest in these children was motivated by anything other than Christian charity. He was the archetypal muscular Christian of the Victorian age. By all reports, Gordon was celibate and deeply religious. Wherever he went, he took the Bible and a generous supply of brandy. Since the war in China, he had led several campaigns in Africa. He had a reputation as a maverick who frequently disobeyed orders. This was the man the British government chose to send to the Sudan. The extraordinary foolish thing was to employ Gordon who was an undisciplined schoolboy as a boy's own paper's hero, um, probably a drunk as well, um, uh, a sort of, by Gladstone standards, an extraordinarily crude, um, born-again Christian, if you like, during his sober periods. On a wintry evening in January 1885, leading members of the government and army waited outside London's Charing Cross station. They were here to see off the hero on the first stage of his journey to the Sudanese capital, Khartoum. Gordon was late. He'd been dining with friends and lost track of time playing with their children. He'd also forgotten to bring any money. 
The foreign secretary hurried off to buy Gordon a ticket. The others dug into their pockets, giving him a gold watch and all their spare cash. One of the generals dashed off to raise more. So Garnet Woolsey went racing round the gentlemen clubs of St. James, saying to the people at the bridge and having dinner, quick, quick, give me all the money you have. Gordon is going to Khartoum and he hasn't got any money. This must have thrown a, a slight frisson, I suspect, through high circles, because you send someone off on a d very delicate mission who hasn't even bothered to go to the bank. Wolsey raised about 200 pounds and hurried back to the station. It was, in a way, a wonderful little Victorian vignette the night that Gordon left for Khartoum. The uh, Duke of Cambridge held the door of the carriage open, and Sir Garnet Wolsey put his luggage inside. And they all shook him by the hand, and he got in, closed the door, and uh, the engine blew its whistle, and the guard waved the flag, and the train steamed out, taking Gordon to his destiny. The Foreign Secretary, Lord Granville, was the only one to express doubts. So they returned uh, to the Reform Club, sat around in their leather armchairs, thinking, and Lord Granville had a glass of brandy and was um, swilling it around, sniffing it, and he suddenly turned to his colleagues and said, I wonder if we haven't committed the most dreadful folly. His doubts were echoed by the British Consul in Cairo. It is not easy to deal with a man who, in moments of difficulty, takes his instructions from the prophet Isaiah. Gordon got two sets of instructions. The first was to go there, find out what was really going on, and make a report as to whether the Mahdist rebellion could be, uh, could be handled, could be suppressed. And the other one was, if that couldn't be done, then he was to report on how the European uh, traders in Khartoum could be evacuated. But of course, when he went there, because Gordon always went his own way, he decided to do something completely different. Gordon was dismayed by what he found in the Sudan. Men, women, and children were herded in chains across the desert for shipment to the great Arab slave markets, where the men were castrated and sold as eunuchs, and the women stripped and auctioned for service in the harems. Gordon assumed command in Khartoum, and he made a bonfire of the notorious whips used by the slave traders and the Sudanese rulers to control their people. He was determined to be the savior of the oppressed Sudanese. I have come here without troops, but with God's help, we shall address the evils of the Sudan. First, Gordon would try to make an ally of the man he had been sent to confront, the Mahdi. He sent him a ceremonial uniform, offering personal friendship if the Mahdi would call an end to his holy war. Gordon now learned what manner of man he was dealing with. The Mahdi sent the uniform back with a patched jibba, worn by the desert tribesmen, and a note inviting Gordon to convert to Islam and join his army. Gordon realized that the Mahdi was a man, like himself, who could not be bought. A man who took his instructions from the Prophet, except that in the case of the Mahdi, it was not the Prophet Isaiah, it was the Prophet Muhammad. Gordon then decided that the only way to deal with the Mahdi was to beat him in battle. His first step was to improve the city's defenses. He sent out patrols to find out what the Mahdi's forces were up to, um, prepared stocks of ammunition, trained the troops, dug trenches. He did all the things that a professional soldier would do. Gordon took advantage of Khartoum's position, where the White Nile and the Blue Nile merge. He dug a defensive channel between the two rivers, sealing off the city. Then he sat back and waited for the Mahdi's attack. The Mahdi's forces cut the single telegraph link with Cairo and settled down to starve the city into surrender. Gordon was trapped in Khartoum with 35,000 men, women, and children. To save them, he now had to have help from Britain. 
His strategic aim was to shame the British government into sending a force down to fight the Mahdi. And he was going to do that by hanging on until they had no option but to come and get him out. But in London, his request for help fell on deaf ears. Gladstone was determined that Britain would not be dragged into a war in the Sudan. On the contrary, he sympathized with the Mahdi's struggle. Gladstone felt that the British Empire was already far too big and if anything should be contracted. But above all, he was the head of the government. He simply wasn't going to be uh, dragged into a foreign war by some half-crazed um, royal engineer general who decided to uh, take over a town in the middle of nowhere and hold it, hold it against all odds. It wasn't part of the government policy. Gladstone told Parliament... To send troops would be a war of conquest against a people struggling to be free and struggling rightly to be free. But Gordon trapped in Khartoum, he put the British government in the trap. After all, it had been their idea to send Gordon to the Sudan in the first place. And now this eccentric hero had captured the public imagination. They couldn't just leave him there to die. Besides, there was the Queen to reckon with. Victoria shared her people's fears for the safety of General Gordon. This handsome warrior seemed to embody all the martial and Christian virtues of her empire. She wrote to Gladstone. The Queen trembles for General Gordon's safety. If anything befalls him, the result will be awful. Gordon is in danger. You are bound to try and save him. For the honor of the government and the nation, he must not be abandoned. But month after month, while Gordon held out against the Mahdi, Gladstone held out against the Queen. No one was prepared to give in. The situation in, in Khartoum steadily deteriorated. Food started to run out. There were food riots in the town. People tried to desert, though that um, proved less than popular when the Mahdi's forces cut their heads off. Um, slowly, the, the ring tightened, and by the autumn, uh, the town was fully under siege, and there was no way out at all. They just had to, to stand their ground or wait for a relief force. From the besieged city, the ports were smuggled out and taken down the Nile by steamboat. Soon, all England knew that Gordon stood alone in his quarters in the governor's palace, watching day after day for the British troops he hoped would be sent from Egypt. He wrote to the British consul in Cairo. How many times have we written asking for reinforcements? No answer at all has come to us, and the hearts of men have become weary of this delay. While you are eating and drinking and resting on good beds, we are watching night and day, endeavoring to quell the movements of this false Mahdi. Gordon in Khartoum was a Victorian epic. I mean, here was a you know, British general uh, in this howling wilderness, surrounded by savages, uh, fighting for uh, the good old cause and Christianity, and, uh, and we had to get him out. That, it was, uh, the British liked that, uh, the last man of the last round sort of scenario. public had already regarded Gordon as a hero, Chinese Gordon, and here he was again being heroic in Africa and the government had to do something about it. So there was a considerable amount of pressure on Gladstone and a growing public pressure to do something and mount a, a relief expedition. Eight months into Gordon's mission, Gladstone finally cracked. He ordered the British army to invade the Sudan and bring Gordon out. But before they could reach Khartoum, Gordon's defenses began to crumble. On the morning of the 26th of January, 1885, the Mahdi launched his final assault. Hordes of warriors poured through a gap in the city walls. Gordon hurried to the roof of the governor's palace. In the streets below, the people of Khartoum were being butchered by the Mahdi's forces. Gordon had a machine gun on the top of the palace, a gardener machine gun, like a Gatling. 
and he engaged the largest forces coming through the streets towards the palace with that until uh, they got too close and he couldn't depress the barrel of the gun anymore. When the Mahdi's warriors reached the palace walls, Gordon left the roof. Alone in his quarters, he put on his dress uniform and prepared to meet his fate. Accounts differ as to what happened next. By that time, the Mardists had already killed the guards and swarmed into the garden of the palace and were rushing towards him. Apparently, he arrived at the top of the steps just as the Mardist spearmen and swordsmen arrived at the bottom and they just confronted each other. Quite an amazing sight that they'd finally see in Gordon, the man they'd probably heard so much about, the, uh, the devil. There is the famous uh, picture uh, drawn presumably from accounts or simple fantasy that the spearman rushed up the steps and sank a spear into Gordon's chest and he fell forward into the crowd and they cut him to pieces. This is the icon which uh, British artists quickly reproduced and uh, became as you like the first Christian imperial martyr. Uh, the men who actually saw him die 40 years later told the British officers in the Sudan that he'd in fact died firing his revolver in a corridor, uh, in a skirmish. But he looks much better, if you like, almost cinematographic, to have him standing there, noble, upright, uh, champion of England, meeting his fate. Later that day, Gordon's head was shown to one of his officers who had been taken captive. Then it was fixed in the fork of a tree where small boys pelted it with stones and camel dung. The Queen held Gladstone personally responsible. She wrote to her private secretary. Mr. Gladstone and the government have Gordon's innocent, noble, heroic blood on their consciences. No one who reflects on how he was sent out and refused help can deny it. She fired off a furious telegram to the Prime Minister who was on his way by train to London. Victoria's cables to her ministers were invariably sent in code, but not this one. This one could have been read by anyone on the telegraph line, and it was intended as a public rebuke to the man who had failed her empire and its greatest hero. The telegram was presented to Gladstone by a country station master. These news from Khartoum are frightful. To think that all this might have been prevented and many precious lives saved by earlier action is too fearful. Gladstone, unswayed by public or royal hysteria, ordered the British army to quit the Sudan. But Gladstone had misjudged the mood of the people and of Parliament. The death of Gordon fatally weakened his government. At the next election, he was voted out of office. It was immensely damaging incident to Gadsden. Gadsden totally failed to appreciate that somebody to him who appeared a rather insubordinate and crude and untrustworthy junior general would appear to the bulk of the British opinion, and indeed to the Queen, going back to that, as being a real hero of the imperial age. Gladstone's fall from power was to have serious repercussions throughout the empire, particularly in southern Africa. The absence of his moral influence cleared the way for a man who would lead Victoria's empire down a far more perilous path. Cecil John Rhodes had arrived in South Africa at the age of 17 to work on his brother's cotton farm. There was nothing to distinguish Rhodes from thousands of other British emigrants who left the mother country to seek their fortune in the British colonies. But this young clergyman's son would devote most of his life to expanding British rule and making himself the most dangerous man in Queen Victoria's empire. At first, his ambitions were limited to being a successful farmer. 
He got along well with his African workers, shared their food and hospitality, and respected their values. Rhodes had an intuitive feeling for the people of Africa. He was fascinated in African society. He would spend whole nights in kraals. He wanted to understand how they operate. He was quick to learn Zulu so he could communicate directly. He also understood the value that Africans placed on a person's trust. And he was much mocked by the other cotton farmers because he used to pay his labor in advance. And that was seen by the people who worked for him as a sign of trust. And of course, it built up their loyalty. But Rhodes was soon lured away from farming. His arrival in Africa had coincided with a fateful discovery 500 miles away on a remote farmstead known as Colesburg Kopi. A Dutch settler noticed his neighbor's children playing kick or five stone. His eye was caught by a stone that shone with a particular brightness, and he went to take a closer look. An earlier British visitor had written of this desolate interior. Her Majesty possesses not in all her empire another strip of land so unlovely. But as the world would soon discover, it contained riches beyond the dreams of avarice. The stone that the settler had spotted would be called the Eureka Stone. And it led to the richest source of diamonds ever found. Rhodes dropped everything, packed his bags, and joined the diamond rush. The farm at Colesburg Kopi soon became the boom town of Kimberley. Roughnecks from the gold fields of California and Australia rubbed shoulders with veterans from the American Civil War, English aristocrats and immigrants from the ghettos of Europe, all drawn to a hole in the ground, which was growing bigger every day. To these men, Kimberly promised instant riches, but at a price. Kimberly was an indescribable place. The noise, the dust, the heat, if you can imagine this settlement of 40,000 people in the middle of nowhere, you could see the dust from the diggings from 10, 15 miles away. And as you came nearer, you entered this awful place. Huts built out of old packing cases, littered with dead animals, the carcasses of dead animals, flies, infestations of flies. The Wild West was tame compared to Kimberley. Here, there was a bar for every 16 men, and shootings were an everyday occurrence. But Rhodes thrived as a diamond digger. Within a year, he wrote to his mother that he was earning around 100 pounds a week, enough to make him one of the richest young men in England. But in 1872, just a few days after his 19th birthday, Rhodes suffered a heart attack. His doctors told him the attack was mild, but Rhodes knew that from then on, he was engaged in a race with death. He chose a curious form of convalescence, an epic trek across the African veldt. Some believe that during this journey, Rhodes developed his great love and his great plan for Africa. A lot of commentators have said that those nine months that Rhodes spent touring Africa by ox wagon from right up into Boer territory had an incredible effect on him. Rhodes will be continually hearing stories about the African interior from wandering hunters. And I believe that it was on that journey that he formed his first nascent ideas of an Africa that was there, ready to be reached, ready to be taken. His health restored, Rhodes returned to the diamond field. Most of the diggers thought that the diamond mine was exhausted and wanted to sell their claims. Rhodes took a gamble and bought them. His hunch was right. 
Beneath the first seam of diamonds was another, even richer. Rhodes put all the claims under the control of one company, De Beers. Within 10 years, it would own 90% of the world's diamond production. Rhodes would use his wealth to finance his dreams. Money is power. And what can one accomplish without power? Cecil Rhodes was half a visionary and half a scoundrel. Uh, he was an extraordinarily greedy man. It's recorded that once on an expedition in southern Africa, he was sleeping alongside a British officer, and there was one blanket between them. And throughout the night, Rhodes always managed to get the whole blanket, leading his colleague to remain cold. Uh, Rhodes want, always wanted to get his hands on other people's property. Rhodes dreamed of creating a vast British colony across the length of Africa. To achieve this, he planned to build a railroad from Cape Town to Cairo. But first he needed to win political support in South Africa. He was elected to the Cape Parliament, where he courted the Afrikaner Bund, the party of the Dutch farmers or Boers, who were consolidating their own power by taking it from the native Africans. We're talking at a stage when black people in the Cape voted, provided they fulfilled certain property requirements. They, they, they sat on juries where they sat in judgment over white people. This was abhorrent to the Africana Bond. And what Rhodes did was to form a very, very close alliance with them. Rhodes, who had once prided himself on his lack of prejudice, made a speech in the new Cape Parliament. Does this house think that it is right that men in a state of pure barbarism should have the vote? Treat the natives as a subject people. Be the lords over them. The native is to be treated as a child and denied the franchise. Following Rhodes' speech, the law was changed. The vote in Southern Africa was removed from all but a handful of native Africans. Rhodes, throughout his career, was continually shifting the pieces on the board. Consider the diamond mines. If you go back to the beginning of that history, black people owned claims. They were competitors with whites. What Rhodes's requirements were was to have a permanent, reliable black labor force who would be kept within compounds, unable to leave at all, inspected every time they came out of the mines. And the need for a controlled labor force drove Rhodes towards racist policies. If you try to make any political sense out of Rhodes' career, it makes absolutely no sense at all. But if you look at it in economic terms, it makes perfect sense. The alliances that he was making was for profit and for business, and there's no argument about it. The next step in Rhodes' master plan was to expand British territory northward into those regions David Livingstone had explored years before. But across his route lay the empire of the Matabili, the people of the Long Shield, one of the most formidable warrior nations in Africa. Their king, Lobangula, known as the Eater of Men, maintained a reign of terror from his capital at Bulawayo the place of slaughter. Gold had been discovered on his land and several European adventurers were after it. But Rhodes was after more than gold. He wanted Lobangula's country. The story of Rhodes and Lobangula is fascinating and it is foul. The two men never met and yet they had an extraordinarily strong relationship through intermediaries. Rhodes sent three of his agents to meet Lobangula, and in a bid to impress the Matabili king, he included among them the brother-in-law of the great David Livingston, John Moffat. But Lobangula was in no hurry to see them, and the men were forced to stay in an enclosure where the king kept his goats. There was a long, long wait for Rhodes' emissaries. Rudd particularly writes back about the appalling conditions, the mud, the flies, the stench, um, the impatience that they had there. They were kept waiting literally for months while Lobangula 
made up his mind. And finally, after all this waiting, Lomangula signified that he was willing to have a grand indaba to discuss whether they would grant a concession to Rhodes' consortium. John Moffat presented Lobangula with a document that would grant Rhodes extraordinary powers. The complete and exclusive charge over all metals and minerals situated in my kingdom, principalities and dominions, together with full power to do all the things that they may deem necessary to win and procure the same. He eventually signed a document on the understanding that he was simply granting prospecting rights to Rhodes' company for his men to dig ten holes in his territory. And what Lobengula had signed, he had virtually signed away his country. Armed with that document, Rhodes was able to go to London seeking a royal charter which would be Britain's endorsement of his rights to that territory. Rhodes was now famous. He was widely admired for his immense wealth and achievement. But many distrusted him as a man who would let nothing, not even the British government, stand in the way of his ambition. The Queen was curious about her overmighty subject. She invited Rhodes to stay at Windsor Castle. when he eventually met Queen Victoria, he charmed her. There's a wonderful moment where uh, it's said that she said to him, is it true, Mr. Rhodes, that you're a woman hater? To which he replied, how can I possibly hate a sex to which your majesty belongs? Rhodes won the Queen's approval and a royal charter authorizing him to exploit King Lobengula's concession. It gave him legal rights to recruit a company police force and build forts throughout the region. The powers of an independent state. But Rhodes still needed to break the power of Lobengula. To achieve this, he called on his closest friend, Dr. Leander Starr Jamison, a gambler, an adventurer, and a ruthless opportunist. His chance came when Lobengula launched an attack on a weaker tribe in a dispute over cattle. Jamison sent a message to Rhodes. We have the excuse for a row over murdered women and children, and the getting of Matabili land would give us a tremendous lift in shares. Jamison recruited a force of 1,400 white mercenaries. Each man was promised 6,000 acres of Lobengula's land and 15 claims to prospect for gold. When Rhodes and Jamison between them decided that the time was ripe to take Matabili land, the key ingredient, the key weapon for them was the Maxim gun, the machine gun. Now this was a weapon that fired 60 bullets a second. This had never, never been used in battle before. And it's extraordinary that a company, a corporation, should possess the most top secret weapon, as it were, of the, that the British Army possessed. But Rhodes had Maxim guns. The Matabili were mainly armed with spears and clubs. The result was devastating. Rhodes' Maxim guns just cut through the advancing Matabili again and again and again. It was like scything grass. They didn't stand a chance. The losses were enormous, 3,000 on one day. Um, it was slaughter. Lobangula fled Bulawayo with his wives. A few days later, his abandoned ox cart was found with the king's body lying nearby. According to one of his followers, the great king of the Matabili had poisoned himself. John Moffat, who had persuaded Lobangula to sign the mining concession, was stricken by remorse. The king was a gentleman in his way and was foully sinned against. In November 1893, Dr. Jamison hoisted the company flag over Bulawayo. Rhodes now had personal control over a vast territory that was to be called Rhodesia. 
A few days later, he made his triumphant entry into Lobengula's former capital and congratulated his troops on their destruction of what he called a ruthless barbarism. John Moffat now had a complete change of heart. The great Rhodes is prancing around. Everyone here is bowing down and worshipping him as the wisest of men. The popular tide is with him. I suppose there will be a crash someday, and men will suddenly recollect that there is still such a thing as justice, even to niggers. Rhodes' reward was to be elected the Prime Minister of Cape Colony. He bought a house on the slopes of Table Mountain overlooking the two oceans, the Indian and the Atlantic. Here he surrounded himself with his male friends and enlightened them with his religious and racial theories. Whites have clearly come out on top in the struggle for existence. Within the white race, the English-speaking man has proved himself to be the most likely instrument of the divine plan to spread justice, liberty and peace over the widest possible area of the planet. Therefore, I shall devote the rest of my life to God's purpose and help him to make the world English. Rhodes was master of all he surveyed, but he wanted more. His lust for power would soon plunge Victoria's empire into its darkest hour. In 1886, gold was discovered in the Transvaal, a state established by some of the Boers to escape British rule. Rhodes feared that the Transvaal Boers, enriched by revenues from gold mines, would become an obstacle to his plans. If they joined forces with German colonists in the west, they would block his route to the north. To avoid this, Rhodes formed an alliance with disgruntled miners in the gold town of Johannesburg and planned an uprising to overthrow the Boers. Jamison assured Rhodes, Anyone could take the Transvaal with a dozen revolvers. So Rhodes devised a plan to take the Transvaal by force. And these were the elements that the people of Johannesburg would rise up in revolution. They would call for assistance, and Jamison would respond to that call with a group of mercenaries and Rhodesian police, and as it were, take the country. The promised uprising failed to materialize, but Jamison continued with the plan. He rode into the Transvaal at the head of his men. But the Boers were ready for them. They let the invaders ride on until they were surrounded, and then picked them off with murderous accuracy. According to the Boer commander, many of Rhodes' raiders were boys in their late teens, and many were weeping. The Jamison raid into the Transvaal was widely regarded as an unprovoked attack on an independent state, a naked act of aggression. It sent shockwaves around the world. Rhodes was forced to resign as Prime Minister of Cape Colony, and he was summoned to London to answer to the British Parliament. But he had nothing to fear. Public opinion in Britain was increasingly anti-Boer. The Queen expressed the popular mood in a letter to her daughter. The Boers are a horrid people, cruel and overbearing. Rhodes had set Britain on a dangerous course. His violent and unscrupulous methods provoked a reaction that shook the Empire to its core. And this at a time when the Queen was preparing to celebrate the glories and triumphs of her reign. Eighteen ninety seven was the year of Victoria's Diamond Jubilee, sixty years on the throne. Soldiers and colonial leaders from all over the Empire came to London to take part in a spectacular parade. It was recorded by the new movie cameras. The little old woman under the umbrella now ruled over a fifth of the population of the planet. A never to be forgotten day. No one ever, I believe, has met with such an ovation. Was given to me. 
The cheering was quite deafening, and every face seemed to be filled with real joy. But this joy would soon turn to disillusion, as soldiers who had paraded the streets of London were sent to fight a war in South Africa. The British dispatched an army to accomplish what Rhodes had failed to do, put an end to Boer independence. The Boer War began just a year after the Queen's Jubilee. Cameramen go out to the Boer War as well, and actually showing film back in the sort of fairground cinemas that were being established at the time, people could go along and, and watch a few flickering images of um, uh, lancers galloping across the veldt or whatever. And it was very exciting. And you had another form of war reporting, it's often forgotten now, in which soldiers at the front used to write back home and say, you know, dear mum, and, and, and describe what's been happening, and the family would take this along to the local newspaper, which would publish it. The British believed the Boer War would be short and glorious, but the Boers were well armed. One English private wrote in his diary, As soon as we started to advance, the bullets began to fly. All of a sudden, a Maxim began to play upon us. That stopped the firing line. A flat on their faces, they fell. And devil of a move would they make at all. The British have gone to war in South Africa, very ill-prepared for this type of warfare. Most of the generals who, who fought the Boers were, were used to people armed with spears and lances. Well, it was a shock for them. There were instances of surrender. People couldn't take it any longer. They just threw down their weapons um, and, and ran back. There were cries of cowardice. I shall never forget the sight of the Highland Brigade after their terrible slaughter. As they came streaming back into our guns, they were no longer men. They had no nerves, did not know where they were. And some of the sights and things that happened, people in England, I'm glad to say, do not know of. Successive defeats shattered the confidence of the British public. Even the staunch Victoria was shaken. No news today, only lists of casualties. The war touched her personally when her own grandson, Prince Christian Victor, was numbered among the dead soldiers. The British stepped up their war effort. They shipped a quarter of a million troops to southern Africa. Slowly, the tide turned against the Boers. The Boer armies were defeated, but their young commandos continued a vicious guerrilla war. In retaliation, the British commander-in-chief, General Kitchener, pursued a war of attrition, burning farmsteads and rounding up women and children. He interned them in the world's first concentration camps. This is carried out at a time when there is a, a massive typhus epidemic already in South Africa. And what happens is that large numbers of Boer civilians are exposed to typhus and cholera, and the result are death camps, which the British press uh, and various British uh, liberals expose as the barbaric methods of warfare. European powers are hostile and portray the British army as brutal. And certainly there is evidence that things were getting out of hand. The mood of the Queen and the public remained stoutly patriotic, but the disasters of the Boer War fed a growing disillusionment from which the imperial ideal would never recover. Cecil Rhodes, the man who had done more than any other to start this war, had one more battle to fight. His heart condition made it difficult for him to breathe. He was carried to his little cottage on the coast in the hope that the fresh sea breezes would relieve his anguish. But here, at the age of 48, he finally lost his race with death. He had left orders that he was to be buried in Rhodesia, in a spot he called 
the view of the world. His grave was marked not with a cross, but with a massive stone. It was, in the words of a British High Commissioner, a haunted, sinister, pagan place. Many of the attitudes that Rhodes had embodied were buried with him. The era of Victoria was over, and with it the unquestioning imperialism she had come to represent. Queen Victoria died in the evening of January 22nd, 1901. She was 81 years old. On her own instructions, she was dressed in white. Spring flowers were sprinkled over her body. Her face was covered by the veil she had worn at her wedding with Prince Albert 60 years before. Queen Victoria's death was seen by many as the passing of an era. But also in 1901, there were fears that other powers were rising up, which might start to put pressure on Britain uh, to yield its primacy in the world. So that at the last days of the Queen's reign, there were fears and misgivings. Medical officers who'd inspected new recruits during the Boer War had concluded that one in three British working men was unfit for military service, were underfed, weak, and prone to disease. There were fears that the people talked about it quite openly, the imperial race was becoming weak. And if Britain was to rule the world, how could she do so with her own population? Perhaps up to a quarter of it lived in destitution. As one socialist said, the sun never sets over the British Empire. It has never risen over the slums of London. Rhodes had overstretched the empire. The Boer republics he had driven Britain to conquer were soon given independence. His aggressive spirit was to be replaced by a Gladstonian liberalism. Those ideals that Prince Albert had instilled in Victoria in the early years of her reign proved in the end to be more enduring than the harsh imperialism of her final decades. <laughs>